Uh, so thanks, John. Uh, that was really kind. And thanks, everybody, for coming. I, I didn't expect such a big crowd. I'm, I'm um, thrilled to see so many people here. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to address this question here, which is how the brains of people with autism differ from typical brains, which seems to me a pretty central question we're going to need to answer uh, if we're going to understand autism. Uh, I'll say right now, I don't think I'm going to give you a very satisfying answer, but I'll, I'll tell you about my efforts uh, to date in this uh, venue. So one of the things we know about autism that comes from the very definition is that at the very core, um, it's a deficit in social cognition. There are all these other phenomena that go along with autism, possible attentional effects, motor effects, um, repetitive behaviors and such, but I think people generally agree that social deficits are really at the core of the phenomenon. So I'm going to focus um, today on looking at the social brain, that is parts of the human brain that are involved in different aspects of social cognition, since that seems most likely to um, tell us something about what's going on with autism. Okay, so what is a social brain? Uh, here's a cartoon picture uh, of a brain with a bunch of regions um, which have been implicated in different aspects of social function. And the first thing you notice is it's a lot of the cortex. There's a lot of, just in terms of area of the brain, um, a lot of it is involved in carrying out different kinds of social functions. Um, another thing that you see even in this little cartoon here is that it's not all homogeneous, as John alluded to. There are different bits in there, um, that some, many of which are functionally very specific. I'll, I'll tell, talk about some of those today. Um, one that, um, that we started off working on oh, about 15 years ago was the fusiform face area, which is actually not right there. It's actually underneath where you can't see it. Um, but that region is very selectively involved in processing faces. Um, a region that um, is primarily the work of Rebecca Sachs and her students, this yellow one here, the TPJ, is quite selectively involved in thinking about what other people are thinking. That's kind of a miracle, it's kind of wild, but it's true, she's shown that very robustly. Um, and these red regions here have been known to be involved in processing language for a long time. Um, and Ev Fedorenko, working with me over the last five years or so, um, has collected, um, I think, really impressive data showing that um, those language regions are actually very specifically involved in processing language. They don't also do double duty for you know, doing mental arithmetic or working memory or cognitive control or any of these other functions. Okay, so these regions are very specific. Um, each of these here has been replicated in many different labs. Um, they are pretty well characterized in typical uh, subjects. That is, for each of these regions, we know a lot about how they behave and what different things they respond to. Uh, and each of these regions is present in pretty much every typical subject, right? So they're just part of the basic architecture uh, of the human brain, and I would say of the human mind as well, which is really why we care about the brain. Uh, and so um, it seems to me this is a good place to start when trying to understand autism. So just to hit that meta point for a little bit longer, um, this suggests a research program in autism where we can start by saying, well, first of all, do people with autism have all this basic architecture? Do they have all that machinery? Uh, and is it of a similar size and selectivity and location in the brain? But then we can also ask whether those regions behave similarly. And behave is an intentionally vague word that can mean all kinds of different things. Does it ha do they have similar connectivity? Do they interact similarly uh, with other regions of the brain? Do they contain similar kinds of information uh, in people with autism as with typical people? So that's roughly the research program I've been trying over the last few years. I can't say that it's been massively successful, but I'll tell you where we've gotten with this enterprise. All um, oh, right, a little more meta stuff first. The, the reason that it seems to me a good idea to start with these things rather than um, other approaches where you might, for example, think up some mental process that seems particularly implicated in autism, devise a new innovative task that you think taps directly into that mental process, scan a bunch of typical subjects and a bunch of people with autism and look for a difference in the activations. That's a res perfectly respectable approach. Lots of people do that. Um, but I think this approach has a number of advantages over that, which I'll mention here. First of all, each of these regions here is extremely robust in typical subjects. So we have kind of a solid foundation to start with. That means that it's easier to detect a difference 
in autism. We know what those things look like in typical subjects. So if they're going to be different in people with autism, we have more of a basis for detecting it. Um, second, each of these things can be found in pretty much every typical um, uh, individual typical subject. Um, and that's useful because we could, in principle, detect heterogeneity in a group of people with autism, heterogeneity being one of the key uh, methodological challenges in studying autism. That's not one thing. It's a big um, schmear of different things. Um, and um, third, because these things are pretty well functionally characterized in typical subjects, that means we have a leg up in understanding what differences in these regions might mean, right? If we find that um, you know, one of these little colored bits in here is absent or smaller or different in people with autism, because we know a bunch about that region in typical subjects, we can make more of that result. Uh, and the final reason I think this is a good idea is that, in a sense, by studying these regions, there's a whole set of procedures for finding them and identifying them and measuring the magnitude of their response. Um, you're essentially tying your hands in a good way. Um, I think a lot of neuroimaging work suffers from um, excessive degrees of freedom. That means you have this huge data set with enormous numbers of dimensions, and you can fish through it every which way. You will find something in there. You are guaranteed to find something in there. But a lot of the somethings you will find will be spurious. Uh, and in contrast, if you start by tying your hands and really restricting your hypothesis space, you're more likely to, you're less likely to discover something spurious. OK, enough meta stuff. Uh, degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, okay. So, so um, this enterprise is in very early days, and most of the data I'll show is pretty preliminary. Uh, but here's what I'm going to try to talk about. So, first of all, we're going to look at um, those face processing regions and ask if they're different in people with autism. Um, second, we'll look at those language processing regions and ask whether they look different in people with autism. Uh, and third, I'm going to briefly mention some data that I have nothing to do with. I just think it's, these data are really cool. Uh, this is work by Rebecca Sachs and Jory Coster-Hale. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about, um, do I have a pointer here? Is this a physical? Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> I feel so powerful. I lost my turn. Of, yes, this region up here, um, the superior temporal sulcus, which has all kinds of interesting stuff in it. Um, and where um, I think it's less understood in typical subjects. So I'll talk about some of the typical data uh, about the functional organization of that region. OK, that's the agenda. Um, so let's start with this face stuff. Um, so we started off doing the very uh, obvious thing that um, other people have done before, which is simply to scan subjects with functional MRI while they're looking at images of faces, scenes, objects, or bodies. In this case, we're showing them movie clips, little three-second movie clips that we shot. We shot movies because they thought, we thought they'd be more engaging for scanning kids. Actually, most of the data, I'm, I think all the data I'm going to show are from adults. Um, the, it's really hard to scan kids. You get a lot of artifacts. I'm not talking about those data. I'm talking about adult data today. Um, and so the way you find those face processing regions in pretty much any subject is to scan them in this, a paradigm like this and then just do a contrast over the whole brain and say, show me the regions that respond significantly more when subjects are looking at faces than objects. OK, when you do that, you get a bunch of regions, um, like these blue ones here. Um, this is a bottom surface of the brain. So if you looked at my brain this way, this is the uh, temporal lobe here, back of the head, front of the head, everybody oriented. It's inflated, so you can see the whole cortical surface. The dark gray bits are the bits that were inside a sulcus, a fold that got inflated so you could see it. So this big blue patch there uh, is the fusiform face area. And this is a face selective region in the spiritemporal sulcus. This is in one subject here, just to get us all oriented. Um, OK, and other regions that are shown here. Um, this is a region that responds selectively to scenes, not, I would consider, part of the social brain. Uh, and the green bit responds more strongly when you look at um, uh, images of bodies and body parts uh, than objects. OK. So, um, oh right, so just, this is just a lame excuse to show you a fun video that I made for that TED Talk. Uh, okay, so this is my brain, um, and I scanned the hell out of myself before my TED Talk so we could find every functionally specific region that I or anybody else uh, has worked on. Um, and so the pink stuff are my language regions. Um, oh, now I'm doing a little half pipe flip here. The red ones 
the red ones on the bottom are my um, fusiform face area. Um, the white ones I'll talk about briefly, those ones are um, very uh, general. They respond to pretty much any kind of mental effort. They're sort of the opposite of all the other regions that respond for very specific kinds of stimuli and specific kinds of mental operations. Okay, uh, oops, no, we like did that enough already. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so now what do these things do? Focusing on that fusiform face area and the STS face region. Um, well, the usual story that you find, which I think is probably approximately right, uh, is that this region back here is more involved in just perceptually representing face identity or face structure, really the, the sort of basic perceptual aspects of processing the shape of a face. Um, whereas these regions up here um, are more involved in kind of higher level kind of social stuff, like perceiving direction of eye gaze, perceiving emotion, and perhaps other things. So that's the usual story, uh, and I think that's you know, approximately right. Uh, here's some data uh, that David Pitcher and I collected uh, a few years ago showing the selectivity of this region. So when I say these things respond selectively, here's an example of what I mean. Uh, this is now the magnitude of response. You identify that region, and then in a separate bunch of data, you measure the magnitude of response in that region to a bunch of different conditions. And you can see it responds a whole bunch more to faces than anything else. Uh, and similarly so to the superior temporal in the superior temporal sulcus face region. Okay, so if it's everybody oriented, that's just showing you what we sort of know already. Um, but then David Pitcher's experiment found something else pretty cool. So what we'd had was um, we just made these movies because we were scanning kids, and we thought, well, that's nice. They'll, they're more fun to look at. And then every found, everybody found them more fun to look at, so we just used them as our standard way to identify these regions. But early on, we wanted to make sure that you pick out the same regions with movies that, we were, that we'd been picking out previously with stills. So we took the movie clips that were just little three-second clips, and we took a, a one-second still, um, sorry, three one-second stills from each three-second clip and presented those in the static condition here. And as you can see, the fusiform face area doesn't give a damn. Like movies, stills, it's all the same. It doesn't care. But the, um, so that's percent signal change. So zero is the response in that part of the brain when you're staring at a dot. Okay, so you can't turn the brain off, but for visually responsive regions, the, best, the most you can turn it off is have people fixate on a dot because there's no eye movements, there's no stuff to look at. That's the best we can do. So it's how, what percent increase does the MRI signal go up from there for each of these conditions? Yeah, and we get really excited by 0.5. Well, so that's huge, right? Um, but keep in mind that that's a percent increase in the MR signal. The MR signal is a very indirect measure of neural activity. And so it does not mean that it's a 0.5% or 1% increase in neural activity. What percent increase in neural activity it is, we don't know from this. It's just an abstract indicator that neural responses went up. Okay. Okay, so the FFA doesn't care about moving versus static things. But this region in the STS cares deeply, okay? So we don't know what that means, but all of the hypotheses I can think of about why that region would care so much about face movies are interesting. So I'm intrigued by that. I can't tell you why it does that, but I think that's pretty cool, okay? Um, so, um, so now we can ask, are these regions affected in autism? Um, so we just do the same thing. We scan adults with autism who've been properly adosed and all of that uh, on this very same paradigm. Um, and, uh, oh yes, background. Yeah. Lots of people have asked this question before. Um, so there's a paper by Bob Schultz, an early one where he said, yes, there's a big difference. People with autism basically process faces as if they were objects. Okay, that was a very compelling story. It was kind of a meme that took off and there's no stopping it. Um, there was another paper that said basically the same thing, and then um, shortly thereafter, people started uh, repeating these experiments. There's a very nice study by Hajikani uh, that found basically the FFA response is pretty much the same in people with autism and typical people, um, but that study isn't cited as much. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, it's been done before, but we thought we'd give it another look. Okay, so we scanned. This is done with Alex Kell, shown here. Um, this, we're still collecting subjects here. I think given the heterogeneity, you just need a lot of subjects. They're hard to get. So we're at 19 adults with autism right now and 31 typical subjects. 
Um, and basically, here's what we find. This is now the volume of the fusiform face area. So you count up the number of voxels in there that reach significance at some fixed threshold. Um, there are other measures that show the same thing. But basically, how big is that region? So basically, there's no difference in our typical group and our autism group in the FFA. They all have FFAs just fine, um, and the FFAs aren't smaller. So the basic region is there. OK. Um, and as a bunch of control regions, um, the body selective region and a bunch of um, scene selective regions also are very similar in um, the adults with autism and the typical subjects. Um, but look what happens with that STS region up there. It's a whole lot smaller, right? So and that's this bar right here. Um, so that region, a lot of subjects you don't see anything at all, any activation up there at all for those uh, face movies compared to object movies. Um, and the ones that have it uh, have much less activation. It's much smaller. Um, so um, so the, the fusiform face areas uh, doesn't seem to be affected, at least in these data. And actually, I'm, I'm not surprised by that, not only because of the prior literature, but because I think basic face discrimination is probably not strongly affected in autism. And we have a, a bunch of behavioral studies where we've looked at that and found that people with autism are, you know, actually, this is kids with autism, are very similar in their ability to discriminate similar faces from one from another as our typical subjects. Yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, these regions are bigger in the right hemisphere than the left, and there's no di difference in the degree of lateralization of these regions between the autism and typical subjects. But I'll get to lateralization when we get to language where we do see differences in autism. Okay. So I'm not surprised that the FFA doesn't seem to be different. I think it's doing these basic um, perceptual discrimination of face processes. Um, um, and, but I think it's cool that, the, um, that this STS region is different. And that really underlines the need to understand what that region is all about uh, in typical subjects. And I'll get back to that in the fourth part of my talk. OK, so on this first part, um, you know, is it, are these basic components there? Um, yes, FFA and, and these other. Uh, regions are present and look normal just in terms of their volume, but the um, face region in the STS is compromised, and we'll return to that. OK, let's talk about these language regions. Um, this is work with Ev Fedorenko. Uh, actually, that understates the case. This work kind of is Ev Fedorenko. I'm the, you know, I'm just sort of, uh, I get to follow along and see the cool things she does. Um, so first, a little background. Um, about five years ago, Ev started by um, doing functional MRI studies in typical subjects, looking at language parts of the brain. And of course, language parts of the brain have been known for 200 years since Broca and Wernicke, so there's no surprise about where they are. Uh, but within the functional imaging literature, what she um, did that most people don't do is look at individual subjects and identify uh, regions in each subject individually. Um, because we think the, that the location of these regions is variable across subjects, and by mushing across subjects, you lose a lot of the precision of the functional specificity that you see in individuals. So she started off by contrasting the response when people read sentences versus when they read strings of pronounceable non-words. Okay? In both cases, you have to remember the string, whether it's a sentence or a list of non-words. Because you get a probe item at the end, and you have to say whether that item was in the sentence or the string. Okay, so actually, that task is a lot harder in the non-word task than the sentence task. We wanted to kind of push mental effort in the opposite direction of sentence processing so that we didn't have an effort confound with the sentence responses. And you see here um, in, um, in two typical subjects, um, you know, each an individual subject, you see nice, robust activations in all the places you'd expect. OK, so no surprise there. Um, to be able to identify those regions in each subject, Ev devised a nice way to kind of look across subjects at, w at the broader region where these activations land. That's those red regions. And here's a few individual subjects shown in here. And so what she's done is devised a way to basically and each individual subject's activation with those broader parcels to define in each subject eight different regions in the left hemisphere. OK, that's just a way to kind of say what's what across subjects. OK. Um, and various reality checks. These regions respond to sentences whether you read them or hear them, as any proper language region should. This is not a, a, a region involved in visual perception or auditory perception. It's involved in high-level 
uh, linguistic structure, the, the syntax and semantics um, of, the, of the structure. Um, and then one of the, um, the next things Ev did was to say, okay, now that we can find these regions in each subject individually, let's ask this classic question of whether language is segregated in the, gr in the brain from the rest of cognition. So do these regions that, that, that respond more when you um, read, read or hear a sentence, do, are they also more engaged when you do all of these other mental tasks that have been argued to overlap in the brain with language processing? So mental arithmetic, um, lots of working memory tasks, cognitive control tasks, all these things, music, all these things that people have argued overlap in the brain with language processing. Um, and no, they don't overlap. When you define those regions in each subject individually, you find, for example, this is essentially Wernicke's area and essentially Broca's area, a high response to sentences compared to non-words, and pretty much no response to any of these other conditions. Um, and it's not that these other tasks don't activate the brain, they activate nearby regions very robustly, just not these regions, okay? So that's cool and important because it means we can target those regions and we're really looking at something about language. They're really a marker for something about language, not about any old aspect of high-level cognition, okay? Okay, um, so that means we can now ask in autism whether these regions are present, whether they're of similar size, whether they show a similar response magnitude, and whether they're lateralized to a similar degree. Okay? Okay, so um, to do that, um, this is also a collaboration with Alex Kell. Um, we started scanning uh, adults with autism, high-functioning adults with autism, on very much the same task. Here's two of them up there. If you just eyeball it, you can see it looks really similar. Uh, it is pretty similar. Um, so then we figured we should get a little more uh, quantitative. Um, so we're still scanning subjects, um, but we're, uh, the data I'm about to show you has now uh, 21 adults with autism um, and a very large pool of uh, typical subjects as a baseline because Ev uses this localizer in all of her experiments, so she's got nice baseline measures. Um, and so first of all, do they have similar, um, are these regions of similar size? So what I'm going to show you is Eight of those um, language regions that I showed you before, identified with that little parcel method. I'm going to show you the volume of, um, of, that, uh, of each language region in typical subjects and autistic subjects. And you see here in the left hemisphere that they're pretty similar, uh, but if anything, um, the, um, the uh, people with autism have larger language regions um, than typical subjects do. And same deal in the right hemisphere. In fact, even more so. So basically, if you look in here in these temporal regions, there's um, uh, substantially larger uh, language activations in the people with autism than the typical subjects. Um, so basically, these regions are larger in ASD. Um, that, um, that increase in size is greater in the temporal lobe than the frontal regions. Um, and it's more so in the right hemisphere, um, leading to what turns out to be um, a pretty sizable difference in lateralization, where the, this is now a measure of how left-sided, how lopsided on the left are those activations. Um, and what you see is that they are um, more lateralized in typical subjects than people with autism. So people with autism have bigger language regions and there's more on the right, okay? Okay. Um, so, and this, you know, this is your question before, does this happen all over the brain in autism? No, it doesn't. Uh, here's the fusiform face area. There's uh, no significant difference in lateralization and a bunch of other um, uh, visual regions that show no difference in lateralization. So it seems to be something about those language regions in particular. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, um, okay, now, um, Here's this, here's this language network that I've been talking about, the set of regions that respond selectively to language. I mentioned before that these kind of astonishingly nothing responses to all of these other tasks um, don't result from you know, a total absence of response to those tasks. In fact, oops, hit the wrong button here. Um, in fact, there's a whole other set of regions that have been called the multiple demand system by um, John Duncan and other people. What he means by that is this other set of regions are, those are those white ones I showed you on my brain. They're the ones that are 
engage, apparently when you do anything difficult at all. They don't care if you're doing that difficult thing on a sentence or a face or an equation or what it is. These regions get engaged. And so just to um, show you what that looks like, here is the response in a couple of those multiple demand regions defined in each subject individually across this suite of tasks. And the um, solid bars here are a difficult condition versus an easy condition. This is spatial working memory, difficult versus easy. Um, this is uh, verbal working memory, difficult versus easy. Basically, every contrast of difficult versus easy, no matter what it is, engages that same region. So these, are, these regions are just completely domain general. They'll, they'll kind of do anything. Whenever you're doing something difficult, they step up and engage. Okay, And there's a whole interesting literature on these regions as one little sidebar um, John Duncan and his co-workers have shown with lesion studies that these regions are related to IQ in the sense that if you, they studied a pool of, I think, 80 patients who had brain damage, and they quantified the volume of brain damage in these regions versus the volume of brain damage outside the brain. And they found that IQ goes down linearly with loss of those regions and is unaffected by loss in the other regions. Okay, so if you lose the other regions, you lose face recognition or language function, or you become deaf or paralyzed, your IQ doesn't go down. But if you lose these regions, your IQ goes down. Okay. So that's a very interesting system. It's different than the language system. And, and, now, and now we can ask, what is the relationship between these two systems? Okay. So there are lots of ways of doing that. None of them perfect in humans. Um, but um, I'll show you one that I think is pretty cool. This is work with Ev uh, Fedorenko and Idan Blank, who's a grad student uh, in the lab. And um, these guys decided to use a method that's been around for over a decade that lots of people use. And we only weren't doing it in my lab because I was just kind of a curmudgeon and I didn't really understand this method and I didn't want to use it because I felt we didn't understand it. But it turns out it's pretty interesting. Okay, so the method, in the method, we define each of these regions and then you scan, you scan subjects while they're just lying in the scanner doing nothing in particular, at rest, whatever that is. They're just lying there. Okay? Um, and you extract the time course from each of these regions identified functionally. right? Um, and then what you can do is ask whether those time courses at rest are correlated across two different language regions with, within a subject, or across two different parts of this multiple, multiple demand system, or between language regions, regions and multiple demand regions. Okay, so the reason I hadn't messed with this method is nobody knows exactly what these correlations mean. They are not a pure measure of direct structural connectivity. There are parts of the brain that are very strongly, that produce strong correlations with this method that we know are not directly connected, which is what made me nervous. Nonetheless, I think when you see the data, you'll see there's real structure in these correlations, whatever it is they mean. Okay, so I'm gonna show you um, a correlation matrix. So we take all of those regions of interest, all of the language ones up here, the multiple demand ones here, and we just look at the strength of the correlation at rest across those regions. And what you see is a big square for all the language regions. Basically, every language region is correlated at rest with every other language region, particularly in the uppermost square. That's the left hemisphere language regions. Those are probably the real deal. Um, and all of the multiple demand regions are correlated with other multiple demand regions, but there are not correlations between the two systems. So here are these big brain systems that, that span, you know, from the temporal lobe up to the frontal lobe for the language system and the parietal lobe up to the frontal lobe for the multiple demand system across big expanses. Um, and um, they're, they're all pretty strongly correlated despite those big distances in the brain at rest, but they're not correlated between. So here's the mean correlation uh, between any two language systems, between any two multiple demand systems, and between a language and a multiple demand system. So that's pretty neat. As I say, we don't know exactly what it means, but there's, there's real structure here. It means something. Um, and um, so then we can ask whether you see this in people with autism. Answer, it looks exactly the same in high-functioning people with autism. So I'm sorry about the long string of you know, null to small results, but that's just what it is. Like this, I think it's um, pretty interesting. It says that not only is, are the basic language regions present, and in fact, even larger, 
um, they're showing the same patterns of correlations with other systems um, that we see in typical subjects. Okay. Um, okay, so to summarize all of this, um, and as I say, we're, we're still collecting subjects. I think given the heterogeneity, 20 subjects isn't enough. I think 30 is a bare minimum. We're having a tough time recruiting, uh, but we just hired a new recruiter, so I hope we'll wrap these studies up soon. Anyway, um, yes, these, these basic systems are, are present with more or less the same topography and high-functioning people with autism. Um, they are even larger in autism. They're more bilateral, less lateralized in autism. Uh, and they seem to show similar interactions uh, with other regions of the brain. Um, so uh, frankly, I don't know what all these, these differences mean. Um, what does a larger uh, range of activation, a larger region of activation mean? I, you know, who the hell knows, right? But, <laughs> uh, but there are some precedents for um, the idea that a larger activation reflects a you know, less efficient uh, neural activity um, that's been shown before in motor cortex. And actually, Ev Fedorenko has also seen this. I don't know if you guys saw around a year or two ago, there was this high school kid who knows, I forget how many languages, 30, 40, some insane number of languages. The guy's a real um, prodigy polyglot. Well, she brought him up to Boston and scanned him and looked at his language activations, and they are tiny. So who knows? Maybe when your system becomes more efficient, it produces a smaller activation. Um, and as far as the... Um, reduced lateralization in autism. I think that's interesting. It's certainly been seen before, uh, although not with this individual subject method we're using here. Um, but it's not very specific. You see this also in schizophrenia, specific language or disorder, um, and uh, epilepsy and other disorders. Yeah. Uh, yes, we balance for that in these comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't make a difference much as Jim wants it to. Um, I just showed him all my non-differences in the typical subject. So he, he's interested in the idea that, that um, what happens in autism is, is that the reason you get an uneven male-female ratio in autism is in part that, you, that you know, girls start with an edge in social cognition and that, that you would see these differences even in a male versus female contrast in the typical population. And I resisted his exhortations to look at this for a long time because I'm allergic to sex differences in the brain. I don't trust the public with sex differences in the brain. The whole thing makes me nervous. But at his urging, I looked. Um, and uh, and we, don't, we don't see any significant sex differences in any of the measures I'm going to tell you about here um, that show a difference between people with autism and typical subjects. There are some trends that he's excited about, but they're not even close to significant. Um, OK. So given that we don't yet know what this means, what do we do with this? Well, I think the next step is to try to figure out what um, the lateralization means and what the um, size of activation means. And I think one way to do that is to do, go back to typical subjects and look for correlations with language abilities and other things between these measures. So we're now engaging in that enterprise. Um, and I think the other um, big thing that will help here is to have more uh, sensitive measures of language processing instead of these really crude things like, is the system there? Well, yeah, the system's there, but so what? You want to know not just that it's there and how big is it, but what information is represented in each of those regions. Um, and so there are um, there's some nice methods to do that. Um, and actually, this is in part why, um, why uh, I brought up the... Um, okay, right. Um, uh, this work by Jory Coster Hale and Rebecca Sachs, even though it's not my work, I think it's a really beautiful illustration of how we can um, use subtler measures with functional MRI to find um, real differences between uh, people with autism and people without. Okay, so just to give you the background, I mentioned this briefly before, but um, starting around 10 years ago, Rebecca Sachs has been studying a bunch of brain regions, but especially this one shown very schematically here, the right TPJ. Um, and that region responds very strongly when you um, do any task that requires you to think about what another person is thinking. And what's astonishing about this region and about Rebecca's data um, is, the, is the specificity of that response. So she's tested a large number of other conditions. This region is not engaged um, when you do logically isomorphic tasks about non-mental representations, right? So in the, 
um, in the mental representation uh, task that activates it, you read stories about what another person knows or thinks. And you have to reason based on their knowledge what they'll do. In the control conditions, she's got people reasoning about a photograph or a map, a physical representation that also can differ from reality. Um, so it's, it's logically the same kind of structure. It's just not a mental representation. It does not activate this region at all. Um, she's also shown that other kinds of social tasks, um, like reasoning about what a person looks like, even very vivid, engaging, unusual looking people and unusual cultural practices, this region is not interested in that at all. Um, the you know, weird cultural practices, it doesn't engage. Um, even reasoning about a person's um, physical bodily sensations like thirst or pain or hunger produces no activation here. This region is only activated when you think about the content of their thoughts. Okay, So that's really extraordinarily specific. Um, and that makes it a, a really prime target for work in autism. Um, because this is really at the, at the core of the deficit in autism, is reasoning about other people's thoughts. OK, so, um, so we can ask, does this, does this region exist in high-functioning people with autism? Now, as a little sidebar, the way you find that region is to scan people while they're doing a task that requires them to reason about other people's thoughts. So if you scan somebody who can't do that task, that doesn't make any sense. So you'd only run these experiments on people high-functioning adults with autism who can now do that task. They probably developed it later. They may be a little slower at it, but they can basically do the task. Um, and when you scan them doing that task, um, this is work with uh, Rebecca's student, Nick Dufour, um, because she also uses uh, this contrast of reasoning about other people's thoughts versus reasoning about physical representations to localize that region. Um, she has lots and lots of typical subjects, 460 in this study. Um, and when she compares those with 30 adults with autism, she finds no group difference at all in any measure of that region. It is there. It's in the same place. It's in the same volume. It's there are uh, you know, many different measures of the nature of that activation. It's just indistinguishable in high-functioning people with autism versus typical subjects. So on the one hand, you know, it's like, what's up with that? That's weird. And on the other hand, Sorry, oh, I'm sorry, theory of mind, that is thinking about other people's thoughts, OK? Um, so um, yeah, and on the other hand, well, this is a crude measure. Maybe it's not that surprising. The basic system is there. Um, here it is. It turns on in the same tasks. Uh, but does it work the same way? So to look at this, Rebecca and Jory Coster-Hale, shown here, asked a deeper question. And that is, what's, what information is represented in there? So what they did is they took the following scenario. They had shown that in typical subjects, when you scan them, um, doing tasks that require them to understand the distinction between accidental harm versus intentional harm, um, not only in this region is this region engaged, but if you look at the pattern of response across that region, you can tell if the person is reading a story about accidental harm or intentional harm. So let me give you one of their examples from their study to show what I mean. So in this paradigm, the subjects are lying in the scanner, reading stories like this. Uh, your family is over for dinner. You wish to show off your culinary skills. For one of the dishes, adding peanuts will really bring out the flavor. Okay? You grind up some peanuts, add them to the dish, and serve them to everyone. Um, your cousin, one of your dinner guests, is severely allergic to peanuts. The plot thickens. OK, now there's two conditions, right? In the accidental harm condition, you then read, you had absolutely no idea about your cousin's allergy when you added the peanuts. Okay? In a different bunch of trials, you would read in the intentional harm condition, you read, you knew about your cousin's peanut allergy when you added the peanuts to the dish. Okay? Um, so the TPJ, that region of the brain, um, you, can t you can tell by looking at the pattern of response in that region uh, whether you're reading a story about accidental harm or intentional harm. So that's pretty fascinating. Further, in some other studies, uh, Rebecca and her student, Leanne Young, showed that if you zap that region with transcranial magnetic stimulation, which messes it up transiently, you reduce uh, people's appreciation of this distinction when they make moral decisions. Okay, So that region is causally involved in representing this distinction. 
oh, it's just, it's nothing that you can make any sense of. It's just a pattern of voxels that has a response profile like this for intentional and like that for accidental, right. you know. It doesn't, if, if you look at the data and you give it to a machine learning system and say, look at those data and tell me which is which, it can perform well above chance. But there's nothing you can make sense of, like this voxel's a little higher here and that one's, it's just some pattern that there's no direct way to interpret, right? Okay, so that information is in there in typical subjects. All of this is preamble to say, um, uh, Oh, and in typical subjects, the magnitude of response, um, oh, sorry, not the magnitude of response, the amount of that information present in that region is also predictive in typical subjects of the degree to which they respect the distinction between accidental and intentional harm in making moral decisions. Okay, so it predicts individual behavior in typical subjects. Okay, so what do you see in people with autism? Oops, I'm wrong way. This information is absent in the TPJ of people with autism, okay? So that's pretty cool. Um, it says that the basic machinery is there, the basic system is there um, in people with autism, but it works differently and doesn't represent the same information, okay? That's right, and that's right, and people with autism um, pay less attention to that distinction in their moral decisions as well. Yeah, and, and you see it in this part of the brain. Okay, so all of that to say, here's a case, I just said this, the region is there, but it's functioning differently and not representing this information that's represented in typical subjects. Okay, um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I forget what my segue is. I don't really have a segue here. On to the next thing. Um, okay. Uh, that's uh, the temporal parietal junction, that little yellow blob, which is my schematic representation of that region that's engaged in thinking about other people's thoughts. Okay, so last section, this whole region that I've stuck the white oval over there um, has been implicated by many people for a long time in different aspects of high-level social perception. Okay, so I think I put, yeah, so here are two uh, on the left, this is a you know, review article from almost 15 years ago from Truett Allison and Greg McCarthy. And even back then, there were loads of studies that had already shown activations in that region. So this is the superior temporal sulcus, this very long sulcus that goes way along here. Uh, and all these studies had already shown uh, strong responses with functional MRI in that region when people look at different kinds of social perceptual um, stimuli uh, or hear them in some cases. Um, and in a, a review article um, from a bunch of years ago, Hein and Knight um, you know, made a, an updated figure like that, and they looked at these, uh, a bunch of different functions from different studies and stuck a dot up there for each study, and they said, look, this stuff is all interleaved. Um, you have uh, motion processing, speech processing, theory of mind, audiovisual integration, and face processing, all in that same area. Therefore, they say, this argues against a strict functional subdivision of the superior temporal sulcus. Well, that doesn't follow from these data. It doesn't follow from these data because those points up there are from different studies and different people. Further, every one of those points is just the peak from some activation that's a group analysis that's a blurring of each of the individual subjects. So we really have no idea from these kind of um, representations of the, of the literature whether in fact there's a strict segregation up there or not. The only way to find out is to scan all of these tasks in an individual subject and ask whether in that subject these things are segregated or not. As soon as you go pooling across subjects, you're gonna blur things anyway. You're not gonna be able to ask this question of specificity, okay? Okay, so this is what, um, um, this is what Ben Dean and Rebecca Sachs and I have been up to for the last few years. That's Ben up there as a grad student in our uh, program. And when I first said to Rebecca, we have to tackle this, she said, don't you remember? I tried answering that question when I was in graduate school, and I didn't. But anyway, we're trying again. I'm not sure we're doing much better, but anyway, we're doing a little better. Um, okay, so first thing is um, basically the, the simple idea of let's take all of these uh, previously reported tasks that activate that general region, let's run them within subjects, okay? 
Um, so, um, and then let's, so the first thing I'm going to show you is, um, so this is an anatomical mask here following the superior temporal sulcus. So we look at that whole region, and then we look at the pattern of response across that region for each of these contrasts. So this, these are two different theory of mind contrasts, just two different paradigms. Um, at Federenko's language contrast, two different ways to look at voice processing. So Pascal Bélin has been doing a whole series of studies arguing that you get responses up in the spiritemporal sulcus when you listen to human voices. He argues that that response is not about speech per se because it, the same region responds when you hear non-speech vocalizations like crying and sighing and laughing. Um, and then we have uh, face responses up there, our face movies. Okay, so um, what we can do then is ask how similar the pattern of response is across the whole superior temporal sulcus for these different contrasts, right? So if it was all one um, multifunctional region um, that was equally activated by all of these things, we should have a strong and even um, correlation across all of them. But instead, what you see is in the data are split in half before you do it. You first see nice replicability of the pattern of response across that region between the two halves of each task. That's what's shown on the diagonal, those correlations. Um, and you also see a nice kind of replication. So here's two different sets of theory of mind tasks, and there's a correlation in the pattern of response from theory of mind contrast one to theory of mind contrast two, as there should be, but it's nice when things work. Uh, same deal for the two different voice contrasts, but basically all of these other zones are pretty blue. They're not correlated. That tells you it's different, there's a different pattern of response across that region for these different contrasts. In other words, they're not all one big multifunctional thing. There's some structure in here. Okay? Um, okay, so let's zoom in on those uh, face activations um, because recall that I showed you. Um, uh, way back at the beginning of the talk, um, that we that here's a case where we really see what looks like a big difference in autism. Although the fusiform face area uh, respond is the same volume in people with autism and typical subjects, this region in the in the spiritemporal sulcus is uh, really quite a bit smaller in people with autism. So that seems like a a, a promising uh, zone to dig in. Um, and so, what we want to know first is, you know, what is it, what does this region do? So the, the first clue we already have um, is that it cares a lot about face motion, right? So I don't, I don't know where to go with that, but I think it's very, um, very compelling. There's something you get from a three-second movie clip of a face that turns on that region much more strongly than three consecutive stills in the same order from the same movie clip. I mean, they're really similar, and yet not to this part of the brain. So there's something that that video uh, supports perceptually that the stills don't. Um, okay, um, but what, what about other functions that have been ascribed to this region? Okay, so um, uh, Rebecca and Ben and I um, looked at that uh, face responsive region and we measured its response to all of these other tasks here. So this is a smorgasbord of all the uh, contrasts that people have used to show activations in the spiritemporal sulcus. Um, and first, what you see in that right uh, face region is a higher response to faces than objects. Okay, That's how the region was defined, so it better do this. I mean, this is left out data, so it's a replication, but still, that's expected. Um, interestingly, this is the theory of mind contrast, thinking about a person's beliefs versus thinking about physical representations. No difference at all in the theory of mind contrast that activates the, the TPJ very strongly. Um, a little bit of a higher response to biological motion. I'll show you some of these later if I have time. Um, these are moving dots that look like a person walking, um, uh, but not as strong as to faces. Okay, so that's all reasonable and more or less as expected, but here's a surprise. It responds just as much to human voices as it does to faces. Now, this is embarrassing and revealing and kind of fun <laughs> all at once. Um, lots of people, including me, have published papers talking about this region as the STS face region because we had tested a bunch of conditions and it responded a whole lot more to faces than anything else. And we didn't really know what it did, but it didn't really occur to us that it would you know, do anything as scandalous as this. Well, it turns out, um, oops, well, okay, it's not a face region at all. It responds at least as much to voices, okay? And you can see also 
uh, over here, these conditions are all auditory conditions. So this is listening to sentences. This is another theory of mind contrast. But it's also voices. And that same region produces a strong response to all of the conditions that have voices in them, whether it's um, speech or non-speech vocalizations. So um, that's um, interesting and scandalous. Um, and um, so um, this is frustrating because we really don't, we still haven't answered this. So the first two hypotheses we came up with are, OK, what, what, would it, what is it that would be engaged when you look at moving faces and when you hear vocalizations? Well, maybe some kind of audiovisual integration that we do, in fact, more with speech sounds and non-speech sounds, but maybe that's close enough. Um, and the other, um, oops, what am I doing here? Um, the other thought is maybe this region is responding to um, communicative intent in the stimulus, right? So when you hear vocalizations, whether speech or you know, non-speech sounds, usually somebody's trying to communicate with you. And if you look at faces, very often they're trying to communicate with you with their face, whether they're speaking or not. And so that seemed like a good hypothesis. Unfortunately, we've refuted both of these uh, in, a, in an experiment that I'll tell you about offline if you ask me. But it's a little complicated, so I axed it from the talk. There wasn't room. Uh, but just to give you a few examples, we filmed people making gestures with their hands, some of them extremely communicative, stuff like this or this, all kinds of gestures. You look at these hands, they're really lovely videos. They're extremely communicative. This region doesn't respond to those practically at all. Um, it also doesn't respond differentially um, to uh, face motions that are communicative, like a video of a person talking versus a video of a person chewing. <laughs> it likes those both. Like, what? So I, you know, I, I, I'm kind of stumped with this. I don't know what the damn thing is doing. Um, but it's, it's doing something interesting. It's not. Um, it's implicated in autism. It does not respond to all of these conditions. And we will nail it. We just haven't yet. Uh, so instead of um, pursuing that uh, frustrating and ultimately um, you know, still hanging and unresolved question, I'm going to change the topic slightly and tell you about a nearby region. In fact, it's right next door to this region, sometimes slightly overlapping with this region, that does something we have a little more of a handle on. Um, so this is work by Cami Coldewine, shown here. Uh, and she asks the question of whether we have specialized machinery in the brain um, for perceiving social interactions between two people. OK, that's something we do a lot. We care about it. We're really good at it. Um, and um, so she started by using, OK, so here are the point light walkers. Um, this is from another study by Manara. So if you just look at this, you'll see a very rudimentary social interaction. This person says stand. The other person stands. OK, it's not deep. It's not amazing. But you can see that they're communicating with each other. Um, in contrast, here's a video we made where we took those, uh, that uh, top case and we just flipped it like this so they're facing away. And we stuck a line down the middle so that they're perceptually pretty similar, but it's not as clearly communicative, OK, because they're facing away and there's that wall in the way. I find this only partly effective. The timing is such that I see an interaction in there anyway. I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's not perfect. So because I felt we, we weren't able to destroy the percept of an interaction here, we went to a slightly more extreme maneuver where we took just um, cases of people involved in clearly independent activities like this, where I think pretty much nobody's going to perceive a social interaction between these two players. Okay? So we scanned people looking at video clips like these. Uh, and we looked for um, initially a contrast between um, uh, the social interaction case, the top case, and the bottom case, the independent actions case, okay, both of which involve two point light walkers of people doing activities. Okay? Uh, and what we saw was in 20 out of 22 subjects, an activation in a particular region of the superior temporal sulcus, shown here in five of the subjects. That's pretty good for you know, a random crazy thing you try. Like Usually, you don't see something systematic like this. Um, so that was sort of encouraging. Uh, and just to show you what that response profile looks like, this is now defining that region with some of the data and then measuring its magnitude of response in left out data, so it's not circular. Uh, and what you see is a strong response to the um, interaction uh, uh, point light movies, much lower 
to the two independent activities and kind of intermediate for the mirrored one, which to me reflects my subjective sense of the strength of social interaction here. Um, so that's pretty good and interesting, um, but we shouldn't believe it yet. Um, it's easy to get things on a one shot. Um, maybe it's something weird about the point light movies, right? So next we said, okay, um, let's, let's show some real videos. So we marched the lab up to Cambridge TV where they have, where you can rent out a little video booth and we filmed people in the lab doing simple little interactions like this. Aren't they cute? Um, that's Don Blank and Terry Scott. Okay, so here's independent activities. Okay, so same basic contrast, but just with a video. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so what do we find? Same deal, higher response to the interactions than the independent activities. Okay, um, it's a little less selective here. I, you know, I think you can actually infer an interaction even for the independent ones. Anyway, we're now sticking all of these things on Mechanical Turk to get ratings of percepts of interactions, so it's not quite so hand wavy. We'll see what that turns out. But basically, it's the same pattern. Um, so um, then we say, well, okay, what about static information? Like even in a snapshot, you get a sense, okay, these people are interacting, okay, and these people aren't. Uh, or maybe they're having a huff, I don't know. Um, but it's not just proximity, these people aren't interacting, uh, and those people are, okay? So they don't have to be looking at each other. So we scan people looking at uh, stills of people interacting versus not, um, and there we pretty much don't get, I mean, it's significant with enough subjects, but it's, my, it's minuscule, okay? I think this is related to the fact that right next door is that region that likes face motion, it doesn't like face stills, but I can't do much more with it than that. So it doesn't respond to any old interaction. I think those stills have plenty of information about interaction. Um, but we have one more case um, where um, we asked whether a pure motion trajectory without uh, body form is sufficient to engage that region. Uh, and so we return to the um, classic from the, I think, 1940s, the Heider and Simmel study, uh, where they made, where they showed all social interactions just from moving shapes. And so we made our own version of these. Here's an example of moving shapes that are socially interacting. It's a sweet little scenario. Oh, okay, heart, heartwarming, right? Um, okay, in contrast, here are, is a video of two, two shapes that are moving uh, in a principled way, but not socially interacting. These are not even animate. We have a third condition with animate shapes that I'm leaving out for simplicity. Um, okay, so now we can ask, does that same region respond to social interactions even of just simply moving shapes? Totally different stimuli. Answer, yes, big time. Okay, even more selective in this case here. So um, where are we with this? Okay, and it's not just that social interactions are engaging. After all, we're social primates. We have all this social brain. Maybe we just like watching interactions. I think all that's true. But it's not the only re reason that this region is engaged. Because if you look in the fusiform face area, it does not respond differentially to any of these. It does not care at all, okay? Contra what lots of people have said for many years about how fusiform face area is really part of high level semantic social processing. Oh, no, it is not. And you can see that with all of these contrasts. It just cares if there's a face there. It doesn't care about all this high level stuff. Um, so it looks like this region is doing something like perceiving dynamic social interactions. Okay, that's a little squishy. We haven't really nailed it, but it's tantalizing. Um, and so what I want to do next is a number of things, including uh, that method that Coster, Hale, and Sachs used to look at the patterns to see what's represented there. Uh, I want to see if you can tell from the pattern something about the nature of the interactions that you're perceiving. This will be a very interesting case to look at in autism. Um, and uh, I, both to look with pattern analysis and typical subjects so we can look not just at the presence of the region but the information it represents and then to look at both things in autism. And we haven't done that yet but are gearing up to. Okay, so this whole uh, kind of woolly last section here, uh, the superior temporal sulcus has lots of interesting stuff. It's not one big multi-purpose piece of social apparatus. It has structure in there. There are different responses, some of them quite selective, uh, but we haven't nailed it yet. Uh, the face region in there is not a face region. It's doing something more high level. It responds at least as strongly to voices. 
Um, there's much more to be done here. I think this region is very much worth understanding better in typical subjects. I think it's a prime uh, suspect for um, deficits in autism. In fact, we've already seen that with a much lower response to moving faces in that region. Okay, so to wrap up, um, where are we? I, I would argue that um, the basic components of the social brain are pretty much present in people with autism, except possibly for that STS face region that isn't a face region. Um, and I think we need to understand that region much more in typical subjects. Uh, there's a few subtle differences, like the language regions are slightly larger, they're less lateralized, uh, and I think we need to know what uh, the size of language regions and their lateralization means in typical subjects to understand that better. Um, in terms of the way these regions interact, um, those look very similar from that resting functional study that I showed you for the language system. We need to look more at that method with the other regions. Um, and one, uh, one topic that, um, that Rebecca and Ev and others and I are particularly interested in is looking at pragmatic functions. These are how in language, these are really more what the deficits are in language processing and autism. They're not you know, basic syntax or semantics. They're things like understanding non-literal meanings, right? Like, you know, did you go jogging? It's raining, right? That means you have to have incorporate a lot of world knowledge to figure out that it's raining means, no, I didn't go jogging, because who would want to go jogging in the rain or something like that, right? That kind of high-level language processing that requires um, knowing uh, more about the background of the thoughts of the person you're speaking with, bringing in more world knowledge, all of that kind of stuff, uh, I think is a ripe area um, for study with autism. And I think we can um, look at it with the interactions between these language and theory of mind regions. Um, data I didn't talk about, but will if you ask. Um, what about structural uh, connectivity in the brain in people with autism? There's a lot of talk about how the major fiber bundles are, um, are compromised in autism. I think it's um, almost all, well, entirely or almost entirely a big artifact. I'll tell you about that if you want to know. Um, none of the patterns I've shown you today um, are, are, can be significantly seen in contrast of typical males versus females although there are very, very weak, non-significant trends in, for some of them in the same direction. Um, and um, I think one of the most exciting things to do with the future is to not just ask these basic first order questions of, is the basic structure there, but to look at the information content of each of these regions. And I'll stop there, thank you.